Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest Sporties webinar. We're glad you could join us today for Sporties IFR Quiz Hour. This is the fun one. We try to do one of these quiz hour formats once or twice a year where we present you with questions, let you participate a little bit, but ultimately hope you learn a little bit about flying throughout the process. This one is focused on IFR flying. We are wrapping up IFR month here at Sporties. We do that every February where we focus on instrument flying. And so that's what today's quiz is going to cover. So thanks for joining us. My name is John Zimmerman. I'll be your host and uh, quiz show presenter today. I'm the president of Sporties, but more importantly for this, I'm an active pilot. I love instrument flying. It's my favorite thing to do in flying. Some people love aerobatics. I love instrument flying. So that's what I love talking about. I am an instrument ground instructor and I'll be wearing that hat today as we talk about some instrument topics. I'm also the editor of an online magazine called Airfax, which I encourage you to check out, airfaxjournal.com. That's a magazine we've done online for over a decade. We talk about uh, real stories from real pilots, and a lot of those end up talking about instrument flying uh, stories or tips. So that's a fun outlet for instrument flying. I'll give you one quick sales pitch as we get warmed up because we sometimes when we do these quiz hours, people will say, how do I, I really wasn't sure about that question. Where can I go deeper? And my advice to you would be our pilot training app from Sporties. This is a one single app that has over 30 courses available, learn to fly, instrument rating, avionics training, weather, aerobatics, tailwheel, you name it. If you wanna learn about aviation, it's there. This app is available online for your iPad, iPhone, Android device, smart TV, you name it. It's on 10 different platforms. So if you want to dig deeper on any of these topics, check out Sporties Pilot Training app. You can get a free demo at sporties.com slash discover. All right, so a quick overview, and then we're going to dive right into the questions. So uh, get your mouses ready or your touch screen ready. I'm going to present to you 20 multiple choice questions. You'll have about 30 seconds to answer. So I'll read you the question, give you three multiple choice answers. Then I'll pop up the screen where you can vote for which answer you think is correct. Once we have all those answers in, I will show you how everybody else voted. You can see where you stacked up, and then we'll go over the correct answer. And really the point of this is less how well you score and more using these questions as a jumping off point. That last part, we'll have a discussion where I'll explain why I think the question is important or what it might reveal about a bigger IFR topic. So hopefully that's where you pick up some tips and tricks and learn something that makes you a better pilot. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Question number one, and we're going to start out with a little bit of regulation currency here, we're talking about currency when it comes to instrument. How long does a pilot have? How long does a pilot meet the recency of experience requirements for IFR flight after successfully completing an instrument proficiency check if no further IFR flights are made? So we did an IPC. Uh, how long am I uh, current for if I don't make any more IFR flights? Six months? 12 months, calendar months, or 90 days. I'm gonna pop our first question up here and get ready to place your vote. So most of you voted for A, six calendar months, 83% of you. So pretty much an overwhelming result there. So were you correct? Yeah, you were correct. I was trying to be a little easy here out of the gate, but I think it's worth reviewing this. I occasionally see people get tripped up on this uh, and it gets back to FAR 6157. So if you remember FAR part 61, that really has to do with pilot priv privileges and certifications and ratings. And so you may act as PIC if within the last six calendar months, your, your famous currency six approaches, holding procedures and intercepting and tracking courses. That's your standard way of staying current. You need to have that logged in the last six calendar months. After those six months, you're out of instrument currency. So you can no longer go out there and fly uh, IFR in actual conditions. However, it's only after another six months that you then have to go get an IPC with an instructor or examiner. In other words, you have six months to stay current. If you fall out of currency, you have another six month grace period where you can go up and get current again. You can't go fly a trip with passengers, but you can go up and shoot six approaches, do some holds, do some nav tracking before you have to actually go get an IPC. So just one minor point there, if you if you go just outside the six months, the answer is usually, you probably had four approaches maybe and not six. The answer is probably for you to go up by yourself uh, or with a flight instructor, you don't have to do a full IPC, but just get current. All right, question two, let's now go from the uh, regulations to departure and we're gonna talk departure procedures. All departure procedures provide straight ahead obstacle clearance 
provided the aircraft A, climbs to 400 feet above airport elevation before turning, B, turns no sooner than 200 feet AGL, or C, climbs at a rate of at least 350 feet per nautical mile. The winner was A, climbs to 400 feet before turning, but a fair number of you also thought C, climbs at a rate of at least 350 feet per nautical mile. This one's a little trickier. Uh, the correct answer is A, climbs to 400 feet above airport elevation before turning. So 55% of you write, I think departure procedures are one of the most overlooked parts of instrument flying. Uh, and so I wanted to bring this up because lots of people talk about approaches. We even talk about holds a lot, but departures, something you're going to do every single time you fly, even if there's not a published SID. So it's worth thinking about this. And the way departure procedures are written, they all assume you're going to climb to 400 feet before turning. So if you haul it off the runway and out of 50 feet turn left, that's not what the FAA designers expected you to do. As a refresher, there's two types of departure procedures. Uh, that you'll typically see. There's obstacle departure procedures. These are the, quote, ugly procedures. They're in the front of the terminal procedures publication. These are not the charted ones that have a nice pretty picture of it. You have to go looking for one of these, and many pilots, I find, don't even really remember or realize these exist. So that's the example here from Asheville. It's talking to you about departure procedure off of runway 17. It's going to take climb heading 167 to 4600. That's what they're assuming you'll do, but all of these assume you're climbing straight ahead to 400 feet first. And then the second type, maybe a little better known as the standard instrument departures, SIDS. Those are the chartered ones, sort of the brother to the star, the standard terminal arrival. Um, and so these, again, you'll see more with the approach plates in the book, but both of those are types of departure procedures. And if you want to go dig into the details, it's in the Airman's Information Manual, Chapter 5, Section 2-8. It, this is how all departure procedures are written. They assume that you cross the end of the runway at least 35 feet AGL, which I would assume all of you do, climb to 400 feet above airport elevation before turning, and climbs at least 200 feet per nautical mile. So the 39% of you that said 350 feet per nautical mile, you're right, there is a climb requirement in there, but it's not 350, it's 200, which is pretty modest. Even in a, in a lightly powered general aviation airplane, 200 feet per nautical mile, should be achievable under most conditions. But there is an assumption there that you are going to climb and you are going to climb straight ahead. All right, question three. Let's get into an approach chart here. What waypoints are designated as flyover waypoints in this case? And, and you will lose the chart here when I pop up the question. So look carefully here. Option A, missed approach and the final approach fix, the FAF. Missed approach and the initial approach fix of JSER or C, missed approach and runway 06 waypoint. 51% option C, the missed approach and runway 06, and then about a quarter with option A and B. So the correct answer is C, 51% you're correct, missed approach and runway 06. This is a little bit confusing, I think. It, it's In a sense, it's trivia, but I'll tell you, the, the point at the bottom is why I bring this up. So if you look at the legend on an approach plate or a terminal procedure publication, the four-pointed star in a circle means a flyover waypoint. A GPS can anticipate a turn for a lot of these waypoints. So if let's say you're on an autopilot and you've got a glass cockpit and you're going to fly the full procedure from the T, you will actually not fly directly over some of those intermediate fixes. You'll The GPS will anticipate the turn and you'll get close to it, but you won't actually go right to the point and then turn. You can have that turn anticipation. There are certain waypoints, though, that you must fly over before starting to turn to a new course. The missed approach point is critical here and maybe obvious, but sometimes overlooked because what happens if, let's say your approach is not stabilized, it's just not going well, it's time to end this approach, go missed and come back and try it again. Well, the procedure assumes you're going to go missed at the missed approach point or at least fly over that point. So if you decide to go missed before that and make a turn, you are a test pilot now, you're making it up. So uh, don't automatically turn uh, if you have to go miss before that missed approach point. That circle around that star means you, it is a fly over waypoint. You're gonna fly over it. All right, question four, let's talk airspace. You might think I'm an IFR pilot. I don't care about airspace as much anymore, but I think it's important to talk about class G airspace. So class G airspace is that airspace where A, the minimum flight visibility for VFR flight is three miles. B, ATC controls only IFR flights. 
or C, ATC does not control air traffic. This one was pretty clear. We've got 73% of you going with option C, ATC does not control air traffic. 16% it controls IFR flight and 11% with option A. Well, I didn't fool many of you there, you're correct. Class G airspace, ATC does not control air traffic. And I put this in there because sometimes there's confusion of, well, it obviously doesn't control VFR traffic because I don't have to be on a flight plan or talking to anybody, but IFR traffic, uh, there's still something in there, but it's really not. A ATC has no authority or responsibility to control air traffic in class G. So you'll sometimes hear it called uncontrolled airspace, and that is really correct. Uh, there's your whole cheat sheet on entry requirements and visibility and all that kind of stuff. But uh, class G, it really is best described as uncontrolled. And the reason I bring that up is because a lot of times on an instrument approach, you will transition to from controlled to uncontrolled airspace. If you're flying to a smaller airport that's not served by a tower, that usually means you're gonna end up in class G airspace. So if you break out of that approach at a thousand feet, uh, there could very well be an airplane in the pattern. Remember, the VFR weather minimum for Class G airspace is one mile in clear clouds. So if you break out a 1,000 feet, there could be somebody out there with two miles and a 1,200-foot ceiling uh, doing pattern work, and you're not automatically guaranteed to be conflict-free just because you were on an IFR flight plan. So something to look out for as you shoot that approach. Don't assume ATC's control goes all the way down to the ground at an outlying airport. All right. Question five, we're going to get a little technical here. Let's talk about runway visual range or RVR. What does the runway visual range RVR value found on some approach charts mean? You can see an example here in an approach plate. The slant range a pilot would see down final approach and during landing. The slant range the pilot can see while crossing the threshold on glide slope. Or the horizontal distance a pilot should see when looking down the runway. Almost universal here, 80% option C, horizontal distance when looking down the runway. Well, you are correct, didn't fool any of you there. RVR really is an airline thing. If you're a GA pilot, RVR is not something you should be worried about. You're gonna go based on visibility and ceilings, but it's worth looking at because at some larger airports, especially airline airports, you'll see RVR reported in the METAR when the weather is really down. And I think it's nice to know ex at least a little bit what you're looking at. RVR is the horizontal distance looking down a runway, and it's runway specific. So uh, again, this is only available at larger airports. You won't see this even at class D or some class C airports. Uh, it's specific to the runway because if you think about some larger uh, airports and Greater Cincinnati Airport, close to Sporties here as an example, there are four runways, three parallel runways. It's a long way from 18 left to 18 right. And there can be fog on 18 left and no fog on 18 right. So the idea of RVR is you have a runway specific visibility indicator. Uh, but it is the horizontal dis distance. It's looking down the runway. And that is slightly different than what you're going to see on approach. So if you're coming down the glide slope, you are looking at slant range. It's not going to exactly match. So there's your conversion chart there. You can see um, that, you know, 4,000 RVR is three quarters of a mile. You'll see airliners operating in 1600 RVR. That is really, really low. So if you're in your 172, it may be a day to stay at home and let the, the pros earn their pay. Question six, let's stick with the weather a little bit. What are some characteristics of stable air? A, clouds with little vertical development, B, turbulence and good surface visibility, or C, gusty winds and heavy rain showers? Boy, nobody confused on this one. And I'm happy to see this, 94% clouds with little vertical development. That is a overwhelming re result, and you are correct, clouds with little vertical development. Glad to see this because I see this topic misunderstood a lot, even by some reasonably experienced pilots. I think stability is an overlooked topic when we talk about weather. A lot of times we get caught up in reading the METAR or the TAF or looking at the radar, but a lot of that depends on what is the atmosphere you're flying in. Is this a stable air mass or an unstable air mass? And you can learn a lot just by looking at the clouds. You can look up on a summer day when the popcorn is really popping and those cumulus seem to be exploding vertically quickly on their way to thunderstorms. That's unstable air. That's going to lead to some convection, thunderstorms, a bumpy ride. Uh, on the other hand, stable air, where it's it's more the stratus clouds, lower tops, no vertical developments, no convection, maybe rainy, and there may even be yellow, 
on the radar, but you can fly through it oftentimes quite smoothly, and it's just rain because there's no convection there. So uh, there's lots of ways to, to look at stability of the air. You can look at skew T diagrams, all kinds of different charts. But a lot of times, just looking at the clouds around you uh, is the best way to do it, especially if you're in flight. If you're in cruise and you're deciding whether you need to deviate around some clouds, look at the shape of it. You know, Does it have sharply defined edges? Does it seem to be developing vertically? Uh, a lot of times, you know, clouds are Mother Nature's signs in the sky, and I think reading it in terms of stability is a great way to get a lot out of that. All right, question seven. Let's talk about the nitty-gritty of alternates and flight plans. For an IFR flight plan, can your destination and alternate airports be served only by RNAV approaches? No, the alternate must have a non-GPS approach. Yes, but only if your GPS is WAS enabled. Yes. Any approach approved GPS is allowed. And we've got a little more divided opinion on this one, which is not surprising. This gets to be a technical topic. 55% go with B, yes, but only if your GPS is WAS enabled. And then a little bit of a split between the other two. You are correct, 55%, yes, but only if your GPS is WAS enabled. The FA does look at WAS and non-WAS GPSs differently. This gets confusing, um, and this one has changed over the years as technology has changed. The FAA has updated their policy, so if you haven't been paying close attention, you may not realize some of this. But this is from the AIM again, 1118. So you may fly, you may flight plan, uh, plan a flight using any instrument approach uh, authorized with their WAS avionics key there. Uh, however, if you're using WAS at the alternate airport, flight planning must be based on the RNAV. GPS LNAV or circling minima. So you can't use the LPV minimums for your alternate. Um, now, one thing that confuses people is once you get to that alternate, you absolutely can use the LPV as an approach. It's just you can't use that for alternate filing purposes. So uh, the takeaway here is if you have a lost GPS, if you have a Garmin GTN 650 or 750 or a Garmin 530W or something like that, that is your primary navigator. You do not have to, you know, the old days of having a backup, I'm gonna depend on a VOR approach or a localizer approach. Your GPS absolutely can be used for your primary and your alternate. You just have to use those higher minima when picking that alternate. But if you do have to go to the alternate, feel free to use every tool you have. And if you have LPV available, absolutely use it. So I think this is a good change for most of us. More and more pilots are flying with WAS GPSs, so the FAA has recognized reality that these are quite reliable. There's some details to read here about RAIM and other things, but at the end of the day, yes, you absolutely can uh, use GPS for both airports. Let's look at another approach chart here. Uh, this one, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, may be a familiar airport for you. At what minimum altitude should you cross the POBR LOM during the localizer runway 36 approach, 3000 MSL, 2700 MSL, or 2610 MSL. Pretty universal on this one. Looks like we've got 77% went with option B, 2700 MSL, 16% option C, 2610. Well, very good. You didn't fall for my little trap there. B is the correct answer. And the, the only point here is to, if you look at the chart, there's two numbers you'll see. The underlying altitude is the mandatory altitude for the localizer approach. You'll see that 2610 number, it's on there. And if I go back here, you'll see 2610's on there, but that is typically for an ILS approach. The 2610 will be the local, the glide slope intercept altitude. So if you're on established on final approach, you're intercepting a glide slope, you will cross the LOM, the outer marker at 2610. But in this case, we're flying the localizer approach, no glide slope. So in this case, we have to cross that outer marker at 2,700 feet. So the point here is just to pay attention to the approach you are flying. Is this a precision approach or a non-precision approach? Am I using the glide slope? Is that available? If so, I can just intercept the glide slope, fly it down. Good thing to cross check my glide slope intercept altitude, make sure it's correct. Uh, or am I on a non-precision approach? I need to obey those underlying altitudes for all the step down fixes. All right, another approach uh, chart question here. You're making a circling approach for runway 10 left at Billings. Your VSO is 65 knots. What approach category should you use? Category A, B, or C? And 86% went with option A, 
a few with option B and a fewer still option C. Well, I'm going with option B and a little bit of a trap question here maybe, but we're making the circling approach. So here's a reminder on your categories, category A, B, C, D, E, 91 knots is sort of the cutoff from A to B, 91 to 121, and then on up to the faster ones. I'm gonna go to the AIM here and quote some chapter and verse for some of the details. It says, based on a speed of VREF if specified, and most light airplanes, you know, Cessna 172, there's no VREF. Those are typically jets that have a VREF published. Or 1.3 VSO at maximum certified landing rate. So wait, so VSO is the stall speed uh, calculated and in the POH, it's not something we calculate. But if it is necessary to operate at a speed in excess of the upper limit of the speed range for an aircraft's category, the minimums for the higher category must be used. So it very much does depend what speed you're going to circle at. Uh, and the 1.3 VSO is great for straight in approaches. I'm, I may be getting a little nitpicky here and we could debate what, what speed you're gonna circle at. But the key point is if you are doing a circling approach, uh, you absolutely should consider stepping up your visibility requirement to category B or even C if you're flying a faster airplane because the speed at which you circle is gonna really determine your minimums. And more importantly, is gonna determine what's good for you. Uh, if anybody's done a circling approach in really scuzzy weather, it's not a great feeling, and the bare minimum on visibility is probably not enough. So uh, that, that's the important one there. I know most of us don't do a lot of circling approaches, but sometimes uh, in uh, certain airports with terrain, that's the only option, uh, or with wind. So always remember, if you're circling, really think hard about what speed am I going to circle at, uh, and you probably shouldn't be circling right at VSO. You should be adding some speed there for the turns in the pattern. All right, question 10. You arrive at your destination on IFR flight plan, which is a prerequisite condition for the performance of a contact approach? A, ground visibility of at least two statute miles. B, clear of clouds and at least one statute mile flight visibility. C, flight visibility must be at least two statute miles. Another pretty clear winner here. We've got 89% option B, clear of clouds and at least one statute mile. Flight visibility uh, with option C coming in second place here. Well, you're correct. Clear clouds and one mile is the correct answer, B. Contact approach is pretty rare. A lot of people have probably never done one. There are instances though where it's pretty useful, I've found. If it's an airport you know well, uh, it can sometimes uh, get you on the ground safely without maybe having to fly all the way around a long detour to go fly a full approach. So it's definitely a, a tool to have in your tool bag in case you need it, but there are some things to keep in mind you've got to have if you're going to use this tool. First, you have to ask for it. ATC cannot initiate this approach. So they're not going to go shopping for, hey, one, two, three, four, five, do you want to shoot a contact approach? You're going to have to ask for it. Second, you do need that one statute mile visibility. The airport must have weather reporting. And most importantly, that maybe the FAA kind of nudging you here, pilots can reasonably expect to continue in those conditions. So it's not like you, you break out, you find one mile and say, great, contact approach, we'll figure it out. You need to have some expectation that the weather's gonna stay that way. Uh, and then three, it must be made to an airport having a standard or special instrument approach procedure. You can see AIM 5462 for more, um, but that's what you need. Now, if you've got it, certainly if you, if you break out and you don't have the runway in sight, you're not ready for a visual approach yet, but the visibility is pretty good and you're clear of the clouds and uh, you, know, you know you can be on a left base for the runway very quickly without having to fly all the way around for an approach, it's definitely something to think about. All right, question 11. In the case of operations over an area not designated as mountainous, where no other minimum altitude is prescribed, no person may operate an aircraft under IFR below an altitude of 500 feet above the highest obstacle, 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle, or 2,000 feet above the highest obstacle. And almost all of you going with option B, 1,000 feet above highest obstacle, 85%. How did we do? You did right. Yeah, not, not that hard of a one. I think most of us have 1,000 feet in our mind is that sort of the standard uh, altitude thousand above when we're talking about IFR. Um, just to quote it in case I always like to give you the place to go read more, FAR 91.177 here has it. 
2,000 feet above the highest obstacle within a distance of four nautical miles from the course. That's how they define it. So you get four nautical miles. Uh, but the question that comes up here is, well, what is mountainous terrain? Who gets to pick? You know, is that little hill 20 miles east of here count as mountainous terrain? Well, it won't surprise you to know the FAA clearly defines this. They have this beautiful 1950s map that they print in the AIM of what is mountainous terrain. And it's pretty extensive. As you can see, it's basically from the front range of the Rockies everywhere west of the West Coast, other than a couple tiny gaps there in uh, the Central Valley there in California and up in by Seattle. And then a pretty good chunk of the Appalachians and, uh, you know, most of the state of Pennsylvania and New York, for example. So maybe more mountainous terrain on the East Coast than you might think at first. If you're flying, you know, from Chicago to Florida or you're flying from uh, New York to, you know, uh, Memphis, you're going to be over a lot of mountainous terrain. So just remember that when you're thinking about 1,000 feet versus 2,000 feet where those uh, areas are. All right, question 12, one of one of my least favorite subjects, but that makes a great one to review, which is lost communications procedures. So here we go. In cruise, your radios fail. Your last clearance was fly a heading and expect the RNAV runway 22 approach. What route should you fly if that's the last thing you heard and your communications just failed? Yeah, definitely a split decision here. Option B was the winner. We've got 37% choosing go direct to the initial approach fix. Uh, option A with 34%. Option C with fly your flight plan route. So definitely a split decision. As I said, not surprised. So I would say it's it's uh, option B, go direct to the initial approach fix for the RNAV 2-2 approach. Uh, there could be some debate and discussion here, but I think this is pretty clearly what uh, is in the FARs and the AIM and what's expected. Now, I'll explain why I think that. Again, chapter and verse here. FAR 91.185 spells it out. And it really, it, it's a little confusing, but it essentially spells out the route and then the altitude. So the route in order is assigned, vectored to, ex told to expect, or filed. The altitude is the highest of assigned, minimum, or expected. So uh, in, in this case, you were told to, you're on a vector, but to expect the approach. And so what ATC is gonna expect you do is go fly that approach. Uh, you're not just gonna fly that heading forever and ever and ever. So uh, you're, you're gonna go ahead and fly that approach on in. And because that expected trumps the filed route, um, that's gonna be your answer. Now, let's talk real world. We, a lot of flight instructors like to get buried in the weeds of this and all kinds of mnemonics of, all these things. Here's what I'd say the real world. Number one, if you lose your radio, fly the airplane. Obvious, we've all heard it, aviate, navigate, communicate in that order, but really important here. Everything will work out if you never talk to anybody, assuming you continue to fly the airplane. So don't forget that part. Fly the airplane, make sure you know where you are, where you're going. Second of all, keep trying. You know, modern radios are reasonably uh, reliable. So a straight hard failure is pretty rare. Oftentimes uh, you can, you know, have fat finger to frequency. You've got the squelch set wrong. So check your radio settings, check the second radio if you've got one. Go back to your last frequency, see if you can raise the last controller. Broadcast on guard, broadcast on 121.5, see if you can get anybody. Again, don't lose sight of aviating, but you've got some other options here you should be trying. Squawk 7600, that'll light up the controller screen, let them know you have a problem. That'll essentially let them clear the airspace and say, all right, well, He's lost calm. We're going to go ahead and clear the uh, RNAV approach here because I assume that's exactly where they're going. Most importantly, find VFR weather. Again, don't descend and do something stupid, but if you break out of the clouds uh, after losing communications, go find a nice uh, uncontrolled airport and land and solve that question on the ground. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Don't feel like you have to fly that route you were told to expect if that takes you back into bad weather just because that's you know the expected route. If you break out and you're in good VFR weather, safest place to handle any questions is on the ground. So I think it's important to keep a distinction between, yes, what's the regulations and run down your list there, but also what's the thing that maintains the most safety? Question 13, let's talk about an arrival. I gave you a departure question earlier. This one's on an arrival, a star. And this one's an RNAV arrival, one of the more modern ones. So here's what you've heard from ATC. You check on with center and they say, descend via the Zelka 2 arrival, except cross BCATs at 7,000. And this is fairly common, you'll hear this. So 
Given that clearance, what altitude should you cross Waria at? And you can see the chart there. Again, the chart will go away. So take a good glimpse at that. Waria is about in the middle of the screen there. So we've been given that clearance. What altitude should we cross Waria at? A, any altitude between your current altitude and 7,000. B, between 11,000 and 13,000. Or C, 7,000. Well, I thought I might fool a few of you on this one, but I was wrong. So as you can see, 82% B, 11,000 to 13,000 feet. And uh, good job. You didn't take the bait on that one. It's maybe fairly intuitive, but sometimes people with these descend via clearances get a little confused. And I sometimes see people overthink it, um, but that's correct. 11,000, 13,000, that's what's charted. You see it right there at Warrior. You've got the line above 13 and the line below 11. That means that's basically blocking in an altitude there, somewhere between there. And if you hear accept on one of these clearances, descend via the whatever arrival, accept. As you might guess, that means everything else remains the same. If you have previous altitude restrictions like we have here, if you have a speed restriction, the route, those all stay the same. So just because they say accept, they, they basically mean every last thing applies except this one thing I'm about to say. Uh, and, and again, you'll hear this fairly regularly. It is important to read back that entire clearance so that uh, ATC can confirm that you got it exactly correct. And when in doubt, ask, uh, especially for if you're a GA pilot, you're probably not flying RNAV arrivals every day like the airline guys are. And so if you're confused by one of these descend via or climb via clearances, just ask, make sure they're clear. Uh, it doesn't hurt. Most controllers are going to be happy you take the time to ask. So, hey, uh, under, you know, read it back and just say, just want to verify that means I'm going to be Warrior 11 to 13,000 in the project. You say, yep, that's correct. So no harm in double checking. All right, question 14, it would not be an instrument quiz without some unusual attitude. So we're going to do it old school six pack style here because that's still what I like, makes the brain work. So take a hard look at that six pack there with the arrows. You just had your, heads, your head down, your eyes closed, your instructor did something to the airplane and then he says, all right, look up. And this is what you see. What is the correct sequence for recovery from the unusual attitude indicated here? Is it A, reduce power, level the wings, lower the nose? B, level wings, add power, lower nose, or C, add power, lower nose, level wings. And the results, a little bit of a split, although we have a majority with C, add power, lower nose, level wings. Uh, coming in second is level wings, add power, lower nose. So these are always good, uh, you know, unusual attitudes may be rare, but I think it's good to think through, it's like a mental exercise uh, on these scenarios. And C is the correct answer here. So good job, 58% of you, you got it correct. Add power lower the nose, then level the wings. So the way to think through this, to me at least, is the first question is, is the nose high or nose low? Because we wanna keep the airplane flying. And if we're either about to stall the airplane or dramatically overspeed the airplane, we need to do something about that. Um, so ask that question. In this case, we've got a nose high, so we need to get the nose down. We need to make sure we don't stall the airplane. So. I, You'll hear different versions. They're usually fairly similar. What I've always been taught in upset prevention recovery courses, push, power, rudder, roll. Uh, the, the push is honestly the most important and it's counterintuitive in a lot of cases, but you wanna you know, unload the wing, you wanna get the wing flying. But I think the important thing, and this is quoting from the Instrument Flying Handbook, the FA textbook, the corrective app control applications are made almost simultaneously. So some people get caught up in, oh, well, I would, you know, why would you add power? I would lower the nose. Well, the truth is you should be adding power, lowering the nose at the same time. The goal is get the airplane flying. And then you can level out. Then you can fix the bank problem. But you don't really need to worry about the bank problem uh, if we've got a, a nose high and we're close to stall. So in this case, you know, push power, rudder roll. And eh, maybe the FAA answer is power push. Uh, and roll, but the point is to think about what is your attitude and let's get the airplane flying. And for the most part, we don't need to think about this as a discrete step one, step two, step three. You can absolutely apply power and lower the nose at the same time. Question 15, let's talk about de-icing equipment. It is February and in the Midwest where Sporties is, that means ice. Uh, so if you're fortunate enough to fly one of these airplanes, an airplane with ice protection systems on its wings, tailplane, propeller, induction system, and pitot tube, we've got a lot of de-ice. Is that A, certificated for flight in known icing conditions? 
B, can be flown in known icing conditions regardless of the certification, or C, may or may not be certificated for flight in known icing conditions. And I didn't fool anybody on this one. Good job. 91% option C, may or may not be certificated for flight in a known ice. Glad nobody took the bait on that one. That is correct answer C. Uh, you really don't know just because you have all that equipment, which is a lot. That might mean you have, you know, boots on the wings and tail. You got to prop the ice. You got a heated pitot tube. That's great. But that really doesn't have anything to do with whether you're uh, certificated for flight in the known ice. That's a something you're going to find in the pilot's operating handbook, probably find in a placard somewhere in the airplane as well. So known ice or Fiki airplanes for flight into known ice, you'll see that a lot, especially in the Cirrus world. Is it Fiki or non-Fiki? It requires specific approval. So it's not something you can decide as a PIC. It is something that's in the manual from the manufacturer. Uh, and that's great. Flight into known ice is, is a great thing in the wintertime. It can give you more options, but it's a reminder just public service announcement, Fiki Airplane is not a free pass to hang out in ice all day. Uh, even uh, the, the picture you see here is a Pilatus PC-12, powerful airplane, lots of good de-ice. Even that airplane, it's really no fun to hang out in ice. So just because you have a known ice airplane does not mean you can just slog through it all day. It is an, something to buy you time to make a plan to exit from the ice. Uh, ice is no fun, so you want to get out of it. What is known ice? I won't hijack this conversation because that's a great barstool debate, but let's just say the FA in 2009 came out with a uh, updated interpretation, the quote unquote bell letter. And it's a little fuzzy, but I think a lot more realistic. Honestly, it talks about, it's not just enough to say, well, there's clouds and it's below freezing. So there's no nice, it's more thoughtful than that. It says, would a reasonable and prudent pilot make the same decision? So it leaves, I think some gray area. It also says just because you accumulate ice in the airplane, that doesn't mean it was known ice and you messed up. Uh, they're they're going to take kind of the totality of the evidence. So uh, I'm not I'm not saying go out there and go looking for ice. It's no fun. But uh, some pilots will occasionally say, well, uh, there's a cloud deck and it's below freezing, so it's guaranteed no ice everywhere. I can't fly, and that's just not true according to the latest FAA interpretation. Question 16. We're getting there. A few left here. Uh, and this one's going to be on wind shear. So while flying a three degree glide slope, a headwind shears to a tailwind. Which conditions should the pilot expect on the glide slope? A, airspeed and pitch attitude decrease, and there is a tendency to go below glide slope. B, airspeed and pitch attitude increase, and there is a tendency to go above glide slope. Or C, airspeed and pitch attitude decrease, and there's a tendency to remain on the glide slope. And we've got another one with a pretty strong majority, 63% went with option A, but uh, about a third of you went with option B. So the real question here, as you can guess, is are we going to pitch down and go below glide slope, or are we going to pitch up and go above the glide slope? That's really what we're talking about here. Option A is correct. Airspeed and pitch attitude decrease and go below glide slope. You may think, well, the Pitch attitude decreases, and when we go below glide slope, how does airspeed also decrease? Well, that's the whole point of windshield, wind shear. If uh, we have a headwind shearing to a tailwind, it's going to feel like the bottom just dropped out, and we're just going to get a sink, and then magically the airspeed is also going to go down. So what, what you really want to guard against here is instinctively pulling back. You can feel the nose drop. You go below glide slope. You say, ah, I got to get that needle back and pull back. And yes, you're going to need to do that, but you need to do that thoughtfully because your airspeed is also a potential problem. So the real answer here is power. Uh, if you've ever seen videos of uh, airliners dealing with wind shear, they have wind shear alerts sometimes. Uh, the answer is even on a big jet is power, power, power. So if you get a headwind sheared or tailwind, you're going to come in with some power and probably a good bit of it if it's a decent wind shear event. Uh, and make sure you watch that airspeed. You can get back on glide slope uh, but make sure you got that airspeed. All right, question 17. This one is one I put in here out of personal experience. This is sort of a, a real world IFR scenario. You are flying an instrument approach to one airport, but landing at another VFR airport, one without an approach. When should you cancel IFR? A, as soon as you reach VFR conditions. B, after landing at your ultimate VFR destination. Or C, this procedure is not legal. You must land at the first airport before going on. And a pretty solid majority here went with option A. 
69% as soon as you reach VFR conditions, 26% went with option B after landing at your destination. You're correct, 69% option A, uh, and maybe that's intuitive, but you can get in trouble here. So let me talk through why uh, I put this on there. This is this is another tool in the toolbox, like the contact approach. Sometimes this is your option. So let's take this example where our ultimate destination is 2-2 India here, Vinton County. No instrument approach there. The weather's down, but it's not terrible. It's certainly not, you know, 301. Um, what we can do is shoot an RNAV approach, say, to Ohio University Airport, and maybe it's the, the approach there to the northeast. And when we break out of the clouds, we can just hang a left turn and sort of scud run over to Vinton County and land there. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and you're gonna be in class G airspace for most of it. In class G airspace, the VFR weather minimum, remember one mile clear clouds. So certainly very legal. Uh, I would suggest you have maybe slightly better than that, but there's nothing illegal about that. One thing to keep in mind here is where does that class G airspace end? And around Ohio University there, you've got that magenta shaded circle um, that's telling you it's 700 feet AGL. Over Vinton County, it's gonna be 1200 feet. So just think about where you are and where does class G start and where do you break out what your weather minimums are. This is something you should be thinking about during pre-flight planning if you think this is a possibility. This is not something you should be thinking about on final approach. Um, more importantly, think about what you can do safely. The, the weather minimum here from the FA is incredibly lax. One mile clear clouds is, is pretty low. So think about realistically, once you break off that approach, can you safely get to the other airport? Is the weather consistent or is it really scattered showers? Are there obstacles? Have you briefed that? Do you have a plan B? If something goes wrong, what are you gonna do? Think through all of this beforehand. There's a couple airports I go into regularly that have no instrument approach. And uh, once or twice a year, this is the only option. We brief it very clearly on here is the absolute lowest we're going to go uh, before we break off the approach. We're not going to go all the way down to minimums and then try to scud run over. We're going to do this to get down to maybe 2,000 feet AGL or 1,500 feet AGL. You want to brief that ahead of time. But most importantly, you want to cancel with ATC when you're still on the approach to the first airport. If you just break off that approach and go land and, and you haven't told ATC, they're going to be very unhappy with you. So uh, don't forget uh, throughout this procedure that you're on an IFR flight plan and you need to tell ATC when you are no longer shooting the approach to the first airport. And if you break it off and go land at the other airport and then call them, they're not going to be happy with that. They need to know before that because they had blocked the airspace around the first airport. So again, another one of those kind of flexible tools, have it in the tool bag, use it wisely, uh, don't use it spur of the moment uh, and plan it through ahead of time. All right, question 18, we're going to go back to an approach chart here. We're on the famous Aspen localizer DME approach. And the symbol on the plan view of this approach represents a minimum safe sector altitude within 25 miles. So that's the top left there. What is my safe altitude? What's it within 25 miles of? The IASE localizer, the IPKN localizer, remember there's two different localizers on this weird approach, or the red table VOR. All right, we'll close this up. The votes came in quickly here and absolutely nobody fooled on this one. I shouldn't say nobody, but not many. 91% uh, here went with option C, red table VOR. And you are correct. You can read. It says there at the top left, MSA DBL 25 NM. And so that's your answer. That's what it's based on. Well, why do I bring this up? You know, DBL VOR here in this case is over 11 miles north of the airport. So that minimum safe altitude guarantees, you know, obstacle and terrain clearance within 25 miles, but it's not 25 miles of the airport. It's within 25 miles of red table. So you're actually down to 14 miles on the south side. So it's worth this absolutely MSA should be part of your every approach briefing, which I hope you do an approach briefing on every single IFR approach, whether you're single pilot or not. This is one of those key things you want to be brief. This is your, oh crap, if something goes wrong, what is my absolute bailout? I've got to get to this altitude while I figure it out. You should have that in the back of your mind, but also remember what that's based on. So in, in Aspen here, you can't go wandering too far to the south because you are at that point making it up. So just a, a reminder that's not always the airport for that MSA. All right, question 19, it wouldn't be an IFR thing without some holding pattern stuff. So we'll throw one at you here. You make a missed approach at the Riverside Municipal Airport. 
what is the recommended entry for the holding pattern at WISP intersection? And take a good peek at that chart in the Mr. Perch procedure and think that through. Option A, direct or teardrop. Option B, or B parallel or teardrop. Option C, direct. Pretty clear winner here with option B, parallel or teardrop, that's 66%, but a few split between the others. Good old holding pattern stuff. That's correct, the 66% of you, parallel or teardrop. Uh, and I'll, I'll draw with my four flight red pen here, kind of what that procedure is. You go Mr. Approach and you make the climbing right turn, Paradise VOR, and then the WISP intersection. You're gonna be going really directly at WISP from the opposite end of how you're gonna hold. So there are different ways to do this. Um, I think probably the classic FAA approach would be a parallel entry here. You're going again, basically on the reciprocal heading. So go straight in and do a parallel. A lot of people, including me, kind of like the teardrop better than the parallel. You, you join further out, so you have more time to get established. And you certainly could do a teardrop here as well. So you could hit WISP, turn left, fly that outbound leg, bring it back around and get established. Either one would be fine. And again, on holding pattern entries, those are really recommended. Uh, as my instrument instructor said, if, if you're a great aerobatic pilot, you wanted to go out there and do a Lamchevac and enter, uh, you could do it. ATC is not really going to know. You do need to stay within the protected area. You can't wander all over the world to enter that hold. Um, but it's not like if you fly a teardrop here instead of a parallel, uh, the FAA is going to come after you for violating the FAR. Those are, are really recommended as long as you're staying inside the protected area. All right, the last question, you've made it all this way. Thanks for your attention. This one, I, I wanted to come back to runways, which may seem like an odd thing for instrument flying, isn't this kind of private pilot stuff, but I think this is helpful for instrument pilots and very few instrument pilots really know the details on this. So here's a typical instrument runway, maybe at a slightly larger airport. What is the distance B? So if you see that section B there, from the beginning uh, of the runway there, to the touchdown zone marker. A, is it 750 feet, B, 500 feet, or C, 250 feet? And pretty well overwhelming here, 83% of you went with option B, 500 feet. And just a few on the other ones. Good job, that's the right answer, 500 feet uh, to that marker. If you're bored and the weather's terrible, there's a lot you could do, but the AIM is loaded with info, I think. And this is one of those, to me, hidden gems. Uh, AIM section two, three, touchdown zone markings identify the touchdown zone for landing operations and are coded to provide distance information in 500 feet increments. These markings consist of groups of one, two, and three rectangular bars symmetrically arranged. So when you look at a runway, there's, it may just look like lines, but it's actually a code. It's sort of like the approach flights. Uh, it's trying to tell you a lot of information. And so if you know what you're looking at, uh, you can actually learn a heck of a lot about how wide is this runway? Uh, how long is the landing area of this runway? How far down the runway am I? Uh, I think if you understand what you're looking at here, there's a lot of good stuff for you. And when you break out in the approach, and you're thrilled to see the runway, take half a second and, and look and see, okay, that's right. Yeah, this is a 100 foot, 100 foot wide runway and there's the touchdown zone. And let me try to get the wheels there. I don't have to put the wheels right on the numbers. Uh, pay a little bit of attention to that, especially in an unfamiliar airport or a big airline airport where there's maybe more markings than you're used to. It's worth knowing what all those mean. And so if you pay attention, here's kind of your cheat sheet. Uh, the number of stripes I like a lot, uh, you know, six stripes, kind of your typical 75 foot, maybe GA airport, eight stripes for a hundred foot wide runway. And if you get to a big uh, airline airport, 150 or even 200 feet wide, you're going to see 12 stripes. So uh, that means a lot when you see one of those. All right, thank you so much for your attention. That was a fun hour. I really enjoyed geeking out on this stuff. If you want to learn more again, Sporty's Pilot Training App, great place to go. But for lots of free content, check out our YouTube channel. We've got webinar recordings, video tips, much more. FlightTrainingCentral.com and AirFactsJournal.com. Those are two free websites we do, packed with articles we post every single week on those. They also have email newsletters. So if you want to really up your game, I encourage you to subscribe to those. They're 100% free. And then Sporties.com slash webinars. That's where you can sign up for future webinars. You can find our webinar archive from all of our previous ones and stay up to date as we do more in the future. 
Thanks again for your attention. Good luck in your instrument flying. I hope you get current, get sharp, and get out there and fly this year. And we hope to see you again on another Sporties webinar.